Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Geeking Out Podcast. I'm the Athletic Geek, and I'm joined once uh, again because Elephant in the Room, our last one, we had an audio issue, so uh, this is uh, the second time. It's like the uh, the Rockers tag team title win over the Hart Foundation or the first night of uh, In Your House, Beware of Dog. It just didn't happen. I'm joined by... Uh, Legendary in the Southern Illinois area wrestler Edmund Livewire McGuire. Thanks for agreeing to do this again. Hey, your time is my time. I'm glad to be back. So, um, if we kind of my time is your time, rather. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) So, if some things kind of feel like they've been said before or something, just elephant in the room, that's why. So, we're kind of you know, the, the good interview was done already just with bad mic work. But uh, first standard question is, were you a wrestling fan growing up? And what are your earliest memories of professional wrestling as a kid? Uh, my family had followed wrestling. Um, I do remember uh, uh, old ICW wrestling out of uh, Kentucky coming here every Sunday to the arena in Cape Girardeau and just the who's who of uh, wrestlers before they really went on the mainstream uh, Macho Man Randy Savage, Jerry the King Lawler, Ravishing Rick Rude, uh, you know, a who's who list of uh, people who would go on the greater fame came through here. You talk about humble beginnings, but my mom and my aunt would, you know, just follow these guys around, not just the Cave Girardeau, but I'm talking like you know, every little town in between they would run, and sometimes I'd be at these shows. My aunt has this big, thick photo album with all these pictures of, uh, you know, all the wrestlers, like, holding me and taking pictures with my cousins and them, and it's just really cool to be able to know that, you know, my wrestling fandom goes back, you know, that far, but when I really got into it was Christmas of 1990 when I got my first uh, wrestling ring, um, toy wrestling ring, WWF action figures included, uh, which were Macho Man and Ultimate Warrior, and I didn't really know what to do with it, so I started, you know, asking my aunt, okay, when does wrestling come on, because I want to know, you know, what kind of moves I can do with these action figurines, and uh, she told me, well, it comes on every Saturday morning. And so I started watching it, and the first thing that I see or that I can remember was this big black figure with red hair and gray gloves and a top hat, and you know. And, you know, I, I guess I don't really have to paint any more of a picture as to who I'm talking about. But for those who don't know, it's The Undertaker. Ever since I've seen him, my life has changed. So uh, he was my first favorite wrestler, and even is till this day. And uh, that's where my wrestling fandom began. So you, your fandom begins with Undertaker. Um, mm-hmm. How uh, how old were you when you started thinking about trying to pursue becoming a professional wrestler? Was there any was there an athletic background, and then the wrestling bug just kind of bit? Did you kind of fade away and then see it again? Did you? Uh, was this, you know, always in your mind to got to, you know, you, I got to be a wrestler. You know, you're always eat, sleep, breathing it, you know, through your younger days, trying to figure out the way to do it. Like, what was your path growing up to making the decision to pursue pro wrestling? And, you know, well, was it always there to just come back? How, take me through that. Well, growing up as a kid on a farm out in the country, I'd always wanted to be a farmer. That kind of came natural. But when wrestling came into my life, even though the whole farmer thing was always there, um, you know, it was like the older I got, the more I got into it, you know, it was always my dream. I always saw myself in the bright lights in WWF or WCW or wherever. You know, that was always a dream, a really, really big pipe dream. But, um, you know, I I never really faltered from uh, being a wrestling fan. I mean, of course, I, you know, liked other things like American Gladiators, but I never was a traditional sports fan. I never played any sports. I didn't really have any true athleticism or anything like that. I just, 
you know, wrestling was my thing. I liked karate and everything and even partook in that for a few years. But, you know, I, I didn't apply myself as much as I probably should have. Right. Um, considering every Monday night was karate night. And, you know, if you're a wrestling fan, you know, Monday night was the pretty huge night of the week, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, we had we had practice maybe like, I think it was like Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturday mornings or something like that. But um, I would always go on Wednesdays and Saturday mornings rather than Monday nights. I'd always try to come up with an excuse not to go on a Monday. <laughs> oh, I got homework, or I got this, but, yeah. So you mentioned, mentioned you had the uh, karate background. Uh, how how far mm-hmm. did you, uh, how, how long did you practice that? You know, did, did you reach any rank, or, you know, anything in particular with that, or? I, you know what, I remember just, you know, minor highlights. I mean, I just remember more people in moments like as far as my rank i think i made it to like yellow or orange belt uh that's not really accomplishing much i mean for those out there listening who you know has taken martial arts you know that's that's basic level stuff but um i mean it was fun while it lasted but you know to truth be told you know i'm i wish looking back that i would have stuck with it but um, it it was still fun to partake in. I mean, it was it it exposed me to something different, got me out of the house, kept me out of trouble, and I got to meet a lot of great people. But uh, you know, wrestling was always my thing, and you know, so you know, <laughs> Monday yeah. nights it was. Monday nights prevailed. <laughs> so. You know, you go through high school. Did you start mm-hmm. training while you were in high school, or were you somebody like a, you know, like a Daniel Bryan who, as soon as high school graduation happens, boom, he's on the way to a wrestling school? Or are you somebody like, you know, uh, kind of in the same vein as Daniel Bryan, Shawn Michaels, who attempted, you know, the traditional means of living and then realized, ah, this isn't for me. Uh, what what was going on? What what led you to finally training, and who did and who did train you, and where did you start at? Take me take me through the journey of this is what I'm gonna do. Um, well, through high school, I do recall going out and or trying to sign up for the wrestling team, and I remember, um, you know, the the wrestling coach was actually our PE coach. And so he had kind of a, a general gauge on who's cut out and who's athletic enough and, you know, so on and so forth. And I, again, and I, I was not an athletic type of kid. Traditional sports didn't interest me. So there was a lot of times I would dress out, but I wouldn't participate. I would grab a wrestling magazine out of my book bag It'd be on the sidelines looking at wrestling magazines. Now, mind you, coach is watching me. So when I go to sign up for wrestling, he's looking at me like, McGuire, what are you doing? And I'm just like, I'm uh, signing up for wrestling coach. And him being an amateur wrestling purist who's talking to this kid who is like a obsessed professional wrestling fan, you know, that was one of many strikes against me. So, you know, when he, you know, he just kind of threw his hands up and was like, well, guys, expect a losing season or whatever. He he didn't say it like all loud, but it was just, you know, one of those things where, you know, you're a kid, you know, even though I know he had reason enough not to believe in me, you know, for a kid to hear that is kind of deflating. Right. So I walked out of the gym throwing my book bag and cussing, and he's just like, McGuire, go to the office, you know. Right. You know, I didn't get a chance to do any amateur wrestling. That would have been the only thing I would have went out for. But um, as far as my um, my route to professional wrestling, it was, I'd say, maybe a year after high school. Um, I moved out on my own by this time, and uh, I my son was – he was – a few months shy of um, coming into this world and 
uh, we attended a wrestling show through word of mouth. We heard that about an hour or so away from where we lived at the time, uh, there was going to be a wrestling show called Attitude Championship Wrestling. Didn't know any of these people, didn't know what to expect, who was on the card, but, you know, we, you know, had time to go and we gathered up a group. We went. It was at the Heron Civic Center here in Illinois. And, um, you know, it was just, you know, kind of a typical wrestling show. But, I mean, it was fun nevertheless. And uh, during that show, I recall hanging on the door or on the table or whatever, a uh, flyer saying, well, if you uh, dream of pursuing a career in professional wrestling, contact blank. And so with a kid on the way working, you know, odd shifts, you know, all that sort of thing, you know, I'm just thinking now, now is not the time to do that. You know, I'm young. I'm 19. I, I can always do it sometime in my 20s, you know. Right. And then um, months later, I remember my son was born by this time. He was a little itty-bitty guy. And um, I'd say this was maybe like, it was February. This was July. I went back to another one of their shows, this time in DeSoto, Illinois. And um, I was just sold like something told me okay it was a it was a life-changing moment for me because you know it was pretty much the same thing you know if you pursue a career if you ever dream of pursuing a career in professional wrestling contact blank so i say maybe about a week or two later i contacted blank blank is homicidal stephen davis and uh, I didn't know who I was talking to, but he kind of put everything together, and he was just like, "Are you the? Are you?" He's a real, real soft-spoken guy too, you know. He looks badass, you know. But right. He's a real, really soft-spoken guy. He was just like, "Well, I didn't even know who I was talking to, mind you." He was just like, "Well, uh, are you the, uh, the the young man that was sitting on the front row?" And I'm like, "Oh, oh yeah." He was just like. You don't know who you're talking to, do you? I'm just like, I wouldn't have a clue. He was just like, uh, homicidal Stephen Davis. And then I tried everything tr- to not to mark out, you know. Right. I mean, to me, you now know, gotta, these guys are like stars, you know, <laughs> even though. Now I got to all- gotta ask you, you know, because you're trying not to mark out. Was Stephen Davis, was, was he uh, the bad guy always whenever you were watching him wrestle? Because that's how I eventually came to know him. Was Stephen Davis the bad guy, or was he – was this another part of Stephen Davis's career where he was playing uh, playing the good guy that I would not be aware of? Well, here, here's a um, – here's a fun fact for you. You know I like to drop fun facts when we're texting, whatever. Right. Um, st- uh, Stephen Davis is pretty well responsible for, you know, at least 90% of the guys that you saw wrestling in Southern Illinois at the shows. Like, he he had his, you know, own training school, and, you know, he was the best out of us all, of his peers and the people he ended up training, you know. We all had various levels of, you know, skill level but he was always you know above and beyond the best but during that part in his career and almost always whether I was a fan or whether I was a peer he was almost always the the bad guy or the heel right um you know he to me I think that's where he was most comfortable and that's where he fit the best I feel like because he was always a ring general had the best grasp on how a match should go, you know, that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he was the one that, you know, broke me in and trained me, um, you know. So oh. that's kind of where it started. He had an old – it's no, it's no longer standing, but the old ACW training school was out there by the airport in Marion, okay. uh, kind of like between Marion and Heron on uh, Route, Route 13 West. There's going to be a but, – there's going to be quite a few people – that listen to this that are going to that are from the area or are familiar with this area that are going to uh-huh. be like oh i remember that and then there's also going to be another section of people going what illinois who what hair what <laughs> mary at what <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh that that's where i trained that it was just a 
big barn of a warehouse. I mean, with a ring in it, nothing fancy, no amenities. You know, just you know, we had for a crash pad, we had an old mattress, and and goodness knows what else happened on that mattress, but whatever. <laughs> um, you know, that's where my beginning started. And to add to that, um, after I'd had my first match, this was August of 2002 when I started training. I had my first match in November of 2002. Um, you know, life kind of happened, and then I didn't have my first singles match until November of 2003. By this time, I'd um, learned of another wrestling school in Sykeston, Missouri. Uh, this one was actually connected to a uh, fitness facility, and uh, it doubled as an MMA training school. And I talked to the gentleman, um, Dangerous Donnie Six. You know, some people may know him, some people may not, but he was very influential in my career, him and his dad. Um, you know, I wound up letting them know that I'd had minimal training, and then my training continued there. I contacted Davis, let him know I was still at it, introduced the two, and from there, you know, it it it, it was on and popping. So, so I became familiar with you. Uh, there was a, it was the night before Super Bowl Sunday near the S yes, outside the SIU arena. There was a WWE SmackDown house show, mm -hmm. and as I'm walking in the snow, getting ready to enter the building, uh, mm -hmm. somebody goes up to me and says, do you guys like TNA? Mm -hmm. And we're like, yeah, we watch TNA. And they hand us a flyer for a, another show in Carbondale, Illinois, from this promotion called All-American Championship Wrestling. Mm -hmm. And appearing on that show, too, is... Eric Young and Tracy Brooks and Abyss and the Naturals and this is before she started with TNA, but ODB. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I could not make this particular show. However, I listened to all my friends that got to go, and outside of the TNA stars and ODB, they mentioned that there is this gentleman named Livewire McGuire, who's probably the best of their guys. <laughs> so. That was wow, where man. that that was my first hear, hearing of Livewire McGuire, but uh, I mentioned AAPW since that's where I know you from. Take me through how with what you know of AAPW's formation and how you got started, you know, basically becoming a cornerstone of that Southern Illinois promotion. Well, by the you said this was February of uh, 07. Yes. I was actually out on that lot handing out flyers. I don't know if I was going up to people asking, did they like TNA? Because, you know, depending on who it was, they may take it the wrong way. But um, I would just put, you know, flyers on their windshield, and it was just blistering cold that day, oh, I yeah. do recall. But, uh, you know, before the show, you know, we figured that was the best avenue to try to get people to come out to the show uh, later that month. Um, by that time, we were just a few months into the company's existence. Uh, AEPW started as a, um, as a uh, fundraiser for a young lady named Abby Milani who was involved in a tent fire, I believe a uh, – citronella candle or something turned over on it and, oh wow yeah and you know if uh the promoter of all american pro wrestling um his name is uh, Aaron, uh, his name is sean uh, chambers he, he's a pro wrestler yeah. named sean chambers we'll Correct. say that for those that don't know there you go thank you um he was a heron police officer and the young lady that was involved in this incident this tragic incident, an unfortunate incident. Um, her dad worked with Sean on the on the PD, so this was you know just one of those things where a lot of the guys agreed to. They just volunteered, and we drew a huge number of people, and it it just 
grew from there, you know, people were aware of who we were, and then we started running area shows. I believe at that time we were we were in Heron first, then we were in, like, Royalton, West Frankfurt. I might be wrong. My timeline might be off or whatever as far as towns and stuff, but, you know, we were just running little small towns, and then we ran the big show in Carbondale, and, you know, we started – you know, it, it was pretty much experimental at first, but then it turned out, you know, okay, we're kind of picking up a little following around here. We might as well have a tournament to crown a champion, you know, and um, myself and Stephen Davis made it to the finals of the, that tournament, and uh, I came up short, and, um, you know, it was, you know, from there, you know, it was my my story in all American pro wrestling was that of the underdog, the one who always kind of, you know, came close and you know close but no cigar, you know. But, um, you know, we wound up running for how many years? Probably let's see, from two thousand October two thousand six to October uh, two thousand twelve, we um, we ran shows so. I mean, there was a lot of ups and downs as far as that went, you know, but, you know, that I believe that comes with any wrestling company. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to have been a part of it all. Every time I went out, hung, fly, hung um, posters or advertisements in the area, you know, it was, you know, rain, sleet, snow, or hell. It didn't matter to me. You know, I was paying my dues. And they say if you find something you enjoy, you're, you're really not working at anything, you know. Um, like, to me, it wasn't work to do that. I was having fun doing it, exposing the product, exposing myself um, in hopes of, you know, gaining, you know, great gain, gaining a ticket buyer, you know. that That was my thing. So to me, I wasn't working. I was having fun. I mean, right. you know, but it was never a problem for me to pay my dues, you know. You, you, you never were done paying dues. So we're we're going to – we'll circle back to AAPW, but uh, how long – so 2002, so by the time – you were wrestling for around four years mm-hmm. by the time AAPW started. Correct. Um, I mean, and this doesn't have to just be like before AAPWs could be from other companies. Are there any interesting road stories you feel comfortable sharing uh, <laughs> from your many travels? You can, you can use your own discretion. You can use uh, you. You do not have to name any names to protect uh, any of the uh, the innocent or those that don't know that this is going on. But right, right. Uh, what are some, uh, you know? It, Seems like everybody in wrestling has some kind of ridiculous story. There's got, oh, I got espe- plenty especially of those. especially in the you know here in the mid Southern Illinois, the Midwest, St. Louis area, and especially further down south, there has to be some ridiculous stories that you could possibly share. Well, al- alongside AAPW, you know, we had sister promotions we worked for. I've worked for companies out of the St. Louis area. Uh, Southeast Missouri, uh, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas. Um, you know, it, it. You know, the Midwest and Mid Mid South was pretty much where I applied my craft at, and um, but mostly Southern Illinois and Indiana. Um, most of my stories come from good old Southern Illinois. <laughs> which I guess in some ways is to be expected. But if I could think of one, I remember this was uh, maybe like June of 2005. This was for Heartland Championship Wrestling out of Anna, Illinois. I don't know if you'd ever heard of anything out of Anna besides like IPAW or whatever. Uh, but uh, Very little Maybe, from maybe not. I'm sorry. Uh, the only thing I really know about Anna, Illinois, is uh, the mental institution that's there. That's about well, it. Well, trust me, this situation here was mental as hell, dude. <laughs> uh, this this uh, promoter, um, he had booked the Moose Lodge for our um, 
wrestling show, which I think he ran that pretty regular, like every month or so. And um, he it just happened to be double booked on this occasion, and it was uh, double booked along with a wedding reception. I believe the wedding reception um, had first dibs. So that left us out in the cold, or in this case, the heat, since it was June, literally. So instead of finding another venue or whatever the case would have been, instead of going through all the trouble of, you know, taking down flyers, getting new ones printed, or whatever, however he would have handled it, um, he just decided to keep things at the Moose Lodge, except this Moose Lodge sat on a hill, and there was this, it was like the Moose Lodge, and next door was like an old dilapidated storefront of some sort. There was this, like, this landing where you, it was like an incline, and it took you to the back parking lot. Well, that's where he decided to hold the wrestling show. On this incline, this ring is lopsided. And he's telling everybody, bring your lawn chairs. And it was like, wow. So as we're, we we had like a tarp set up in the same area where these people were having their wedding reception. You get these big sweaty wrestlers behind a tarp getting dressed all cooped up with one another. <laughs> and we're walking through these people's wedding reception through the kitchen where they're preparing their food at, walking wow. straight out of a door, like the side door, that was our entrance to get to the ring. And there's this alley full of, you know, uh, and a residence, and then a lopsided ring that we could have went ring sledding down this hill. <laughs> but uh, I remember uh, briefly talking to Cowboy Bob Orton, and, you know, he was like, well, uh, I've uh, wrestled at Madison Square Garden, and I've wrestled at Keele Auditorium, and I guess you come full circle. I'm wrestling <laughs> in an alley. <laughs> <laughs> this this is a true story, so, uh, you know, it, 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 that was just a matter of circumstance, but that was one crazy story, and... Um, well, uh, we'll, we'll si I know... From as long as I've known you, there's there's one story we'll get to, and we won't mention names there, but are there any other, you can't see me doing little air quotes with my finger, are there any other uh, stories that you feel comfortable sharing with, where you feel comfortable sharing the name with uh, of a bigger name, where something fun or something innocent like uh, Cowboy Bob, you know, said, or possibly one of the <laughs> TNA guys, you know, any of them just have a, a funny moment that you know that, uh, and you're not really getting anybody in trouble if you uh, mention, mention this. Right. Here. I'm not so much concerned about that. Who am I, you know? But right. um, I, I just, I re just, other than hanging out with Keith Cash one night at Old Charlie's and uh, Marty Janetti. Um, me and a group of Marty Janetti went and ate supper at Denny's one night uh, in Salem, Illinois. I, that's a crazy story that I prefer not to go into. There we uh, go. <laughs> but <laughs> we don't have to. We don't have to. I I'll have to save that one off there. But uh, I do recall one night it was Fairview Heights, Illinois, and this was a this was just a random show. I, I don't remember much about it, but I remember a few, uh, at the time, up-and-coming Ring of Honor stars who had just been involved in a, in a pretty big angle. This was like October, November 2007, if, if my timeline is correct. Um, these guys were booked on this particular show. Now, mind you, both of these guys... Uh, I speak of happened to go on one of whom is like one of WWE's biggest stars right now. Uh, the other one worked in WWE backstage. I believe he's in Impact Wrestling right now uh, behind the scenes. Um, anyway, they had a spat. Apparently, uh, this was while I was out at the ring, you know, doing my thing, and I come back and and 
these guys are like arguing and he's just like, dude, you're talking to my girl and you know, and the other guy's just like dead panning it and he's just like, Well, uh, sorry dude and you know, he took the guy's phone and he threw it and it obliterated against the wall and <laughs> the other guy's just sitting there still dead panning, he's just like, Dude, you broke my phone <laughs> It's <was laughs> like me and like one guy's like completely past one thousand. I can't even say level one hundred. He's like past one thousand, pissed off, and this other guy's like deadpan him the whole time, which would have pissed me off. Um, <laughs> you know, he one busted, you know, went through the guy's phone and found out he was talking to his girl, and just me and you know, you know, Chocolate Thunder, you know, yeah. we just looked at each other like what in the hell is going on here but yeah that that that's probably one of my funniest moments i'd ever seen from you know people who would go on to bigger things <laughs> <laughs> so we uh sir we, we talked we talked about the formation of aapw um, yes sir my first time i ever actually got to see you it was a show in uh what's known as sparta illinois about sparta illinois <laughs> sparta illinois that was the first time uh and it was uh really and i'm not knocking the work that you guys put in there but you guys really worked hard because i came back because this show uh unfortunately was booked at either a kc hall or a vfw or an eagles lot or something mm-hmm and yeah, I remember it being like really small and there was open bar and the ceiling was low to the ground. And, and at that point in time in the state of Illinois, at the yeah. state of Illinois, they had not put the uh, indoor smoking ban yet. So open bar meant you could just <laughs> smoke inside if you wanted to. But you are that, correct. The thing I remember most about that show is feeling bad for each and every one of you because I'm like, d d even <laughs> with the... The ring was like the, the apron was cut like in half, and even then you still couldn't. Anybody over. I felt that it seemed like if they were over six feet tall by an inch, they couldn't even go to the middle rope on this particular oh, dude. show. Oh my gosh. I know what you're talking about because I know when I would go to hit the ropes, you know, usually the ring hits, you know, the, you know, a little bit above upper center of your back. Um, you know, for me, this set of ropes were like almost to my butt. Like it was like I was seven feet tall or something, but yeah, that, that show was crazy. <laughs> uh, but it was good enough that I, uh, I kept coming back. Mm -hmm. Um, West Frankfurt, Illinois kind of became your, uh, I don't want to say base of operations, but it was, there, there was, uh, a, uh, believe it was a church gym that for many years or for many shows, I should say was mm -hmm. kind of the base. Uh, any particular memories of this, uh, of matches or storylines that you want to talk about from West Frankfurt, Illinois? That place holds a lot of memories for me. If I'm not mistaken, I do recall, that used to be an old grade school, and uh, it was no longer operating as such. It was, uh, what was it, the First Assembly? New, be uh, new, new Beginning Assembly. So, yeah, yes. something like that. Just, the name and, just dawned on me again. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I believe uh, Sean knew the pastor there, and they would use that gymnasium for their uh, services and other activities. So we would rent it out monthly or every other month and uh, do our uh, wrestling shows there. Um, you know, it was split locker rooms. So, you know, heels in one locker room, baby faces in another, you know, which that's pretty much how they did it back in the old school, which, you know, made it, it, it was good because it allowed for you to go out there and work on the fly and, and uh, you know, call it as it was out in the ring. And I I personally did not 
like that, like the location, like a lot, like that location actually cost us a lot of tickets because no one, like as far as walk-up tickets, because no one could find it. It was in such a obscure right. part of town. Before, but, we would get lost, the first couple times we tried to find that place, we would get <clears> lost so much, because it's before everybody had a GPS on their smartphone, so we had to oh, go, yeah. we had to go to MapQuest online. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know what I mean. Exactly. The, the, yeah. only thing, the only thing worse than that was uh, the Martial Arts Academy in Carbondale when you guys no longer ran Sports Blast. We got lost on <laughs> Southern Illinois University campus. I think we saw oh. I, I, I think we saw a drug deal go down. Um, I, I, I believe, and I'm not trying to stereotype anything, but anybody that is familiar with this area, you know, I think I heard gunshots where we got lost one time. <laughs> And we didn't know where – we think we finally found it. We didn't know where to park, so we kind of parked out here in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, Jedi, who does the – you know for the normal subscribers who watch the, uh, the weekly wrestling show, it was me and him, and we kind of leave his car, and we're like, well, we'll see if we have tires when we get back. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, so y'all were in the hood, huh? <laughs> I I think this was I don't know if this was the hood per se, but I think this was kind of where that kind of that in between where you're leaving the hood to kind of enter more. Well, what do you say, uh, mainstream Carbondale, if you will? <laughs> I guess if that's what you want to call it, I I don't know what part of Carbondale is mainstream, but. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at we'll that. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> so, but West Frankfurt, uh, Carbondale, kind of your where you were kind of at, mostly West Frankfurt. The first big rival I remember you having was a guy named Thunderbolt Brandon Walker. Yes, now, sir. Thunderbolt Brandon Walker. Now, um, that name may not mean a lot to a lot of people, and I'm just going to level and – if Thunderbolt Brandon Walker hears this, I'm I'm sorry, I, but I don't think he will. Uh, never really got into him. I only cared about him because he's wrestling you. However, Thunderbolt ba- Brandon Walker has two particular people that he trained that are now wrestling in a uh, AEW and WWE, respectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that would be Ricochet and Chuck Taylor. So, um, all this long segue and hype. Tell me about working with Brandon Walker. Not, uh, not Braden Walker, for anybody that may be mistaken. <laughs> well, he didn't knock my brains out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Brandon Walker, I had always heard about him up until the time I got to meet him, which was just randomly at a show in Terre Haute, Indiana, for another company. But, um, you know, he, he was – I think he took some years off, and uh, by the time I met him, he looked far different from pictures and video that I'd seen of him. And he had always had a reputation as a as a shooter, and a, you know, because he has amateur wrestling cred, and he's not afraid to scrap with somebody, uh, legit. So, um, you know, he he always had that kind of a badass reputation. And uh, whenever he came back into the fold, you know, he, you know, started working for us, you know, there were, you know, several guys that were, you know, kind of like, oh, my God, Brandon's here, you know, you know, he, you know, they, they knew his reputation. So, um, you know, for me, you know, I, I just always try to conduct myself as a professional and I've always had good conversations and vibe pretty good with Brandon up until the time we started working together. Um, but we, we, we actually gel pretty well because I think, um, you know, he started seeing, you know, just a lot of stinkers and, you know, he would go out there and see that, you know, people like myself and serial thriller Shane Rich was going out there and working hard and trying to produce quality matches so, um, you know, for him to go out there and work with somebody who, you know, actually went out there and, you know, busted ass, you know, I, I think he appreciated that. And I had uh, one of my 
what I feel, and I don't like to toot my own horn. I haven't seen the match since it happened back in May of 08, but probably my my career match was against Thunderbolt Brandon Walker. Really? Um, yes. Um, it was it was for uh, just uh, an obscure wrestling company. They they did a one night tournament crowning the champion. He made it to the finals. So did I. And uh, this was in Centralia, Illinois, and, uh, you know, we, we went about a good, I don't know, about a good solid 30 minutes. Really? You know, we both had, you know, worked, you know, multiple times at night, and we went out there and just, we tore it up. Like, we paced ourselves, and, and that's what I pride myself on, you know, just, you know, having, you know, marathon-type matches. I've always been a fan of longer matches, but... um yeah, Brandon, he, he's probably my uh, opponent that I've had my best match in my career with. Uh, also, we had a match out in the hot sun in, what was it, St. Peter's, Illinois. It was at some kind of a festival. The ring was out on a tennis court. It was the middle of August. The ring felt like a frying pan, and oh, we wow. went like 45 minutes. I swear we did, dude. It was, it was miserable just for the because I think we both were kind of getting fatigued because, I mean, maybe maybe I'm breaking some kind of fourth wall here, but we were blowing spots like crazy because of fatigue. You know, I don't know if right. that speaks to our professionalism, but you know, it it was what it was, and I'm being as transparent as I can be here. But, um. You know, uh, I had one of my worst matches with him, and I had my very best match with Brandon Walker. So that's my memories of him. So you kind of interesting transition here because probably one of my favorite matches that I witnessed of yours in West Frankfurt, Illinois, was in January of 2009. You mm-hmm. get your first shot at the championship since the tournament final against Serial Thriller Shane Rich. Now, Serial Thriller Shane Rich is kind of, he was um, very talented. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think of uh, the, I'm not saying, I'm not, not going to say anything bad about him. I'm just trying to think he's very different than the normal guy that was booked on these shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it like working with a guy like Shane Rich who is, Completely, you know, AAPW, for, you know, those that don't live in this area, didn't have the honor of getting to watch this in person. It was a very, very old school sort of, you know, style. Absolutely. Serial Thriller and Shane do... Rich was very much like, if there was, we would kind of say, you know, like if there's one guy that could like go to Ring of Honor or go mm-hmm. to uh, something like that out of AAPW, just based on a style. It would have been Shane Rich. What was it like working with Shane Rich, and what was uh, what was it like knowing a guy who some people may know he's kind of got somewhat of a reputation? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had always it kind of like Brandon Walker. You know, I always heard of uh, Shane Rich. You know, by the time I got into wrestling, he was off to the military. Um, he had wrestled a little bit, and he, you remember uh, that Attitude Championship wrestling I mentioned? Yes. He was the first champion for that company. Okay. And he had a completely different look. Like, he wasn't a jack. Uh, if I can recall correctly, I think he might have had longer hair. Oh, but, really? Yeah, but I'd seen videos and stuff, and I'm like, this guy's athletic as hell, you know? But uh, by the time I, I met him, he had came down to our uh, – because we were kind of doubling back and forth between uh, training schools. He had came to the wrestling school down in Sykes, and as he was home uh, on on a break from the military, and uh, I think he was just knocking off ring rust because he had got booked somewhere while he was home. But that was my first time ever meeting him as far as working with him. Uh, he had came home, I think, for good from the military in 06. And he was just jacked to the nines, man. I'm like, this guy, like, the first thing I thought was, 
why aren't you in WWE or or elsewhere? You know, he always seemed like he was destined for for greater things and much more. He would go on to do uh, um you know a, a a skit backstage with Chavo Guerrero and Hornswoggle back in like 2009 when Raw was in St. Louis. He had did I believe he might have did more than just that, but um, he's did some stuff with WWE. Uh, had you know tryouts and so on and so forth, but he always was the type that seemed like he was destined for more. And he had, you know, I'm I'm just gonna be flat out honest with y'all. You know, he he carried himself with a level of professionalism. We both did, but to different extents. Like I always felt like he had a better. Um, way of presenting himself like me i was always your kind of every man you right. know t-shirt and jeans you know if i dressed up it was a polo and a nice pair of you know ironed out jeans or something you know like he always showed up at the shows dressed you know dude was sharp as a tack dude always was fresh man um but i believe that's what set him apart from the rest is how he presented himself, how he carried himself, you know, it might have even rubbed some people the wrong way, you know, because, you know, I've heard other guys say that, you know, he, he has this, you know, better than thou sort of demeanor about him, you know, I just think the guy was confident, he had every reason to be, he had a lot going for him, you know, in and out of wrestling, you know, so, you know, I mean, you can't get mad at someone for being, you know, whether it's cocky or self-assured or confident. You know, you, you can't knock the guy. He he clearly looked the part. Um, he and I were complete, you know, antithesis of one another. You know, again, he, you know, as far as character-wise, you know, he was always an elite athlete. He had the look. He had the skill. You know, he he should have been first and foremost, you know, prominent in anyone's company. Me, you know, I was, you know, it, it was your, we always kind of had that professional rivalry. There was always that genuine mutual respect. I feel like, at least on my part, I always respected, respected the guy because, you know, if he put on that military suit, you know, that, that, that commands respect for me. I've always right. respected him for that. But and I thank him if he if he listens to this, I thank him for all his service to our country. But um, you know, as far as, you know, you know, wrestling and professionalism and so on and so forth, um, you know, I just believe we were just so antithesis to one another that it might have came off as a genuine rivalry again, you know, the way he dresses, the way I dress. You know, the way, you know, it, 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 it bled over from, like, it was like life imitates art, you know. Right. But, uh, you know, he, he wasn't where he was for nothing, you know. He, he should have been the top guy because, you know, he took himself seriously. I've worked out with the guy, and I remember walking away from the workout hating his guts. Not, <laughs> not hating him, hating him, but... You know, I'm like thinking this mother, you know, just grumbling under my voice. But, you know, I mean, no pain, no gain, you know. Yeah. So he was the man. With the best of your recollection, I mean, at this point, at the time of this recording, this was oh, 13 years ago, if you can believe yes. that. Uh, take me through that match. Because this was probably one of my favorite matches. There's a several of them, but we won't be able to get to all of them on this particular evening. Take me through that main event uh, in West Frankfurt that night for the title, you and Rich, when you I'll were both do the basically best I can here. <laughs> when you were well, well, you when you were basically you know from from a fan's perspective, from my perspective, you had Rich's Rich was the champion, but yes. then there was you know, as far as as, as the good guys were concerned, there was you know. You and Rich, and you could be interchangeable. The only thing was just Rich was the champion. 
you know, right. you, you you had your rivalry with with Walker and Mike Masters, and we'll we'll get to Mike Masters maybe another another time because there's a lot to talk. We're about. We're definitely going to have to do this again because oh, yeah. I'm loving this. Yeah. yeah, but to touch on Rich, um, just this particular night because I remember it was. Oh yeah, it did. It, it felt like uh, our rivalry spanned a good two years. I want to say. Well, this was from, again, this is just I, from a fan's perspective, this is the one night where, you know, at the time as a wrestling fan, you know, I came, I kept, I enjoyed AAPW, but obviously, you know, I was a Ring of Honor and a, a TNA oh, guy. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I was just, that was kind of my favorite wrestling at that point in time. I was liking mm-hmm. Brian Danielson. I was liking uh, Nigel McGinnis, uh, AJ right. Styles, wrestlers of that caliber that weren't in mm-hmm. WWE yet. So, so what you're seeing pretty much is this was kind of a match that kind of catered to that that genre or mold that you kind of appreciate. Well, it, it was, you know, th- there were other. I'm not saying that I like those. It was other, kind of the closest thing to it, maybe. Right. The, well, the closest thing I would get from AAPW because yes, yes, you know, there was other promotions in this area, you know, that would Correct. that would book some of that, you know, mm-hmm. th- that that hot indie talent, you know, uh, oh, guys yeah. like, you know, Mike Quackenbush, guys like um, Austin Aries, uh, Claudio, Ty- Claudio, uh, mm-hmm. you know, now Cesaro, uh, Tyler Black, now uh, yes. Seth Rollins, uh, mm-hmm. El Generico, people of that nature that were kind of, I want to say on the regular, but they were, they, they were booked in these other promotions, so whenever I kind of we're looking at the independent shows, Grant, you know, and y'all ran on different weeks, so I never, like, had to say, like, well, fuck APW, the, this group's running, and they got this guy, but it was always kind of like, oh, you know, like, okay, you know, APW, that's going to be fun, we're going to drive about, you know, we're going to drive about 40 minutes, go to APW, we're going to mm-hmm. we're gonna see Livewire, we're going to see some of the people, we're going to see some of the friends, and we're going to enjoy ourselves, we're going to enjoy... These four guys or these five guys that always bring it, and then the rest will kind of go, kind of go like, how the, how the fuck are they? <laughs> how did they get through this? Because we were, and I know, you know, if, it I'll was admit, quite the mix of talent. Or I'll, I'll admit it, it to this day, there were certain guys there where, like, we were just probably, we were probably too snarky for our own good when it came <laughs> to, when it came to judging them. Um, and then, you know, it'd be like, okay, cool. We had fun going to APW, but then like the next week we'll be like, oh my God, we're going to this one. And they got, you know, they're going to have Mike Quackenbush yeah. and Tyler Black. And I got the Ring of Honor DVD when Tyler Black wrestled Brian Danielson. And we're just going to be awesome. And I'm going to spend, <laughs> and I'm going to spend 40 bucks at all their gimmick tables. And yeah, you know, that was Oh kinda... my goodness. So like, we'd always have this big, we'd always have like a different t- sort of hype. For those shows oh, yeah. compared to AAPW. But when this match happened, the 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 atmosphere the atmosphere of the whole crowd and, and including us who were by our by my own admission, and I can't speak for the other, you know, four or five guys would always come, mm-hmm. maybe too smart for our own good. We got into that match and felt like it was like a match that we find in those other, you know, promotions or or a Ring of Honor for that matter. I'll even go so yes. and say that. Long winded explanation. Take me through that night, that match to the best of your recollection. Okay. Well, I do recall. I believe it was a fan vote that got us there. Um, I believe I was just coming off of a rival, one of my many rivalries with X. At the time, he was Axe Stevens. Yes. Uh, then he would later use his real last name, uh, Axe Allwork. But I was just coming off of that. So I had a little momentum, and we were just kind of experimenting, you know, just to kind of maybe boost some ticket sales. You know, we came up with an event called Fans Choice. And, um, you know, we, were, we had, like, some, like, who would you like to see come in? Who would you like to see challenge for the – championship i mean it was like kind of a i guess a what was the event wwe would throw cyber sunday yeah yeah that it was kind of like that one and um you know at the time myspace was really popular and you know we didn't understand the power of it until we saw the response and 
the most voted poll was who would you like to see challenge for the AEPW championship. It was between like myself, Mississippi Madman, maybe a couple of others. But me and Madman were running neck and neck, and I eventually kind of smoked him there in the end. So the match was set. Myself versus Shane Rich, which was, again, you remember that whole antithesis, you know, I mean, we right. were both popular. You know, I feel like he both, both baby Both babyface wrestlers, though, we should Oh, have. no doubt. We both, like, would, you know, just, he got a pretty monstrous ovation. I would come out there and blow the roof off. I mean, it was just, and I feel like for, for different reasons, too, like, you know, I I catered more to you, every, every man, your, your, your working class type. Shane Rich, he was, you know, the again, the elite athlete, you know, everybody loved him, but he was, the women loved him, you know. Right. And so I feel Well, you know like what Kevin Nash all, says, a, a good champion, girls want to fuck. That's the only way to make a good champion in pro wrestling. You Kevin know, Nash said that. <laughs> I heard Jericho say, you know, the guys want to be that guy and the women want to be with that guy. And, and Shane Rich was that guy, you know, you know, I just, you know, I believe all those elements came together and people wanted to see us because it had been, we worked together before, but I believe in AEPW, it had been protected up to that point. So when they saw the match was booked, that drew, I believe, at the time in West Frankfurt, that was our hugest crowd we ever put in that uh, facility. Um, and it, it, I don't feel like it disappointed. Um, you, you, you recollect just the, the style and just the atmosphere that night. I, I, I was in the middle of it all. So I don't think I really could appreciate or, or recall it as much as you do, or at least from your perspective, but um, I just remember just leading into the match. It was like, I, I, I know we're going to beat the hell out of each other tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was expecting nothing less. Um, I, I wanted nothing less because I'm just like, we got a huge crowd here. You know, I, I want to give them however much they paid for their ticket. I want to give them that worth. Um, you know, I, 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 honestly, I don't remember much about the match. I remember, um, one of us took a tumble into the chairs, like we threw them one through the other over the guardrail and one went spinning into several rows of chairs. It was just all over the place. It was kind of a mix of everything. We did some technical wrestling. Um, it was, again, the professional rivalry it was, you know, based on respect and, you know, just, it was mostly competitive, but then it got heated and really in the end, it was kind of, uh, the start of what would go on. Let's see, you said this was 2009. Yes. January of 2009. Okay. We, I believe the rivalry ended in like March of 2011. So this was only the beginning of what you would get. Now, a lot of people remember it for being this awesome match. Like, I think we've had better matches elsewhere, but I do appreciate that you and a few others who remember it hold it on a pedestal. Um, you know, I thank Shane Rich for, for, you know, being a part of it all. You know, I mean, he um, – from a fan standpoint, he was the better man that night. And what's funny is a lot of my best matches or favorite matches or whatever, one, I've probably not seen them on video since it happened. And two, I was usually on the losing end. But, <laughs> I mean, I I just, you know, that's just funny ha-ha part of it. But, I mean, I just – that's that's kind of all I remember about that. And then the crowd was, like, super hot. That's what I remember the most. Like, no matter what either of us did, it was, it was boo, yay. Like, and it was just, it just depended on who the crowd was behind. Who I was don't... getting booed and who was getting yayed. And it was just, it, it took us both out of our elements, so to speak. And I think that just made the whole thing great. The, the way I can compare kind of compare the the crowd what for me mm -hmm. 
it felt like you were going to like it felt like you were going to the Super Bowl in the sense of it wasn't like one team didn't have the home field advantage and you'd be you could be sitting right next to somebody and they could be getting mad that you're happy because they're a Shane Rich fan and they're mad that Livewire's getting over on Rich and then right. I'd be getting annoyed with, you know, this person because Rich is getting over on Livewire, so that that that's the closest I can compare it to. Oh, I think we've lost you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Now we're good. <laughs> I'm good. Um. So we're we're pretty well out of time, but we're gonna have to have you back because this there's a lot more of AAPW and a lot more matches we gotta reminisce about. So, but I wanted to end this uh with. I mean, you've gone into quite a bit of detail, but I do want to do a quilt of some word association with some names that uh, I know you have worked with. Are you okay to do that? Shoot it to me. Okay. First one we're going to do is uh, just Shane Rich. Is there any anything you else you want to say about Shane Rich? Um, quick blurb about him. Oh, yeah. Just, you know, he's a guy I respect. Um, real, real good guy. He he deserves everything that he's ever gotten, not only in wrestling, but in life. Brandon Walker. Um, shooter. Steven Davis. Badass. Sean Chambers. I always hesitate anytime you mention Sean, but it's not meant in no bad way it's like i want to bust out laughing because <laughs> like i used to just needle sean and pick on him but <laughs> i mean Sh sean was, was sean's cool man i mean if if it wasn't for him creating the apw we wouldn't have had a chance to shine so i can't help but be appreciative to the guy for that so and that's there's a lot more uh there's a lot more meat on the bone as Conrad Thompson would say. So mm -hmm. we we will have live wire back hopefully um I I'm, I'm hoping and praying right now that when I exit this program that this is uh legible cuz this is our uh, <laughs> this is our second chance at trying to do it. This is the second time we've attempted interview number one, but there's a lot more to talk about, uh, a lot more rivalries that live wire mm -hmm. had in AAPW. And AAPW for what we're talking about, and it, there's a lot of great memories in that uh, that that church gymnasium. But uh, mm -hmm. it it was not trying to knock the Lord or nothing. It was a shithole. It smelled like <laughs> the uh, the the bathroom was was nasty. But, Stale popcorn. Ugh. But AAPW would would grow and would grow in a very very for an area like this a very very big way and there's a lot more we have left to talk about there's a lot of rivalries that we've kind of touched on uh, here that we haven't even spoken about yet so we will definitely be bringing uh, mr electricity back um, yes. hopefully this uh, <laughs> this worked and uh if you enjoyed this uh video please give it a like share subscribe for more content not just uh for pro wrestling but from the world of comic books anime gaming and all things geek culture go follow me on all my social media pages facebook.com slash athletic geek a9 twitter at athletic underscore geek a9 and instagram at athletic geek 89 and uh live wire uh thanks thanks for being on the show and thanks for uh thanks for all the great matches and memories thank you so much for having me hopefully sooner rather than later we can do this again Absolutely. But let's hope this one worked. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> All right. Thank Later, you, everyone. Man. We'll see you.